Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tales from the Doghouse Separation Anxiety Explained. I am Stacy Bell with Focus Fun in the US, and with me today is. Hello, it's Ness Jones. I am um, with Separation Anxiety and Dogs Decoded, and I am in Australia. Australia, mate. And today we are talking about hyper attachment, and this is um, a topic that came up because a lady, shout out to Lisa, who um, reached out to me um, with her dog, Mr. Bungle, who is a two year old cover dog um, and just having a conversation with her on the phone it does sound like her dog might have hyper attachment um, but Stacy perhaps we should start up, um, off with a maybe a definition of what that what that means yes good idea good mm-hmm. idea yeah so um, separation anxiety um, obviously is where the dog can't be by themselves um, but generally, they can be by, they are okay if they've got somebody with them, and it doesn't matter who it is, as long as there is, as long as there is somebody with them. Uh, Hyper attachment is a little bit more problematic because it's usually one special person in their lives <laughs> that um, they need to be with, um, and so even if there's somebody else with them, um, they still panic uh, when their significant person walks out the door. Yep. Yep. And the reason why that's problematic is because then it makes it harder to keep that dog below threshold where they're comfortable when they're special person, or sometimes it's two people, um, you know, their immediate family usually. Um, but a lot of times it, that, uh, dynamic makes it difficult to keep the dog under threshold in their comfortable zone. Um, And if you're not sure what uh, thresholds are, then feel free to go and dig into our previous episodes, whether you're watching on YouTube or um, listening to us uh, on a podcast, uh, and that will all be explained. Um, I think maybe we should discuss how, I mean, we don't always know why a dog might get hyper-attachment, but we can maybe narrow it down slightly um, we, we can sh- certainly say it's often the primary caregiver that they can get hyper attachment to because they're the ones that, um, you know, are doing all the stuff. All the things. <laughs> all and the things, yes. W- without being, without taking too much of a blanket approach, it's usually the mum, isn't it? Because it's usually the mum that's a the lot of times. caregiver, yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, it's always the mum. Because <laughs> she's doing, usually, well, I know, I don't know what it's like in your home, Stacey, but certainly in mine, feeding, training, walking, playing. My husband cuddles the dogs and gives them treats that they shouldn't have because they're not doggy treats, they're human food. Human treats. Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar in my house. I, I do probably... 95% of all the things. Um, and then, and, and some of it's just because I have a more flexible schedule. Um, and some of it is because I enjoy doing the playing and the training and yeah. Rowan's not much of a cuddler, but he does like snout kisses. And my husband is very fond of giving snout kisses. What are so, they? Um, snout kisses? Snout kisses. So oh, he just snout. holds his face <laughs> okay. and kisses yeah. them pretty much self-explanatory, but yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's the same in my household. There are, you know, obviously there's all different kinds of households with all different kinds of, um, dynamics, but a lot of times I do see that it's, it's the primary caretaker. I think it's, it's safe to say that. Yeah. And, um, I think work from home is probably, Mm -hmm. I don't know, exacerbated the issue. Um, in terms of that dog, you know, and especially if it's a couple and one of them is out all day, you know, some, you know, working out of the house and the other one is at home constantly or mm-hmm. for those people that just live by themselves. That's really hard. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah, it can be, it can be really hard. So um, we've talked about the definition and we've talked about why it's important. So let's, um, let's move on to some strategies. Um, to help people out um, as far as, you know, how do we mitigate this hyper attachment or help our dogs um, build relationships with other people, which I think is the biggest thing. Like if we're talking about 
you know, the biggest thing that you can do to help your dog, it is to, to help them build relationships with other people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so getting the dog to bond with other people so that mm-hmm. the significant caregiver, you might, might take a bit more of a backseat and get the dog to learn to love other people and not just you. <laughs> yeah, and I think the big thing there is if you are um, – looking at something like Rover or Share My Dog or um, some other caregiving type of um, thing is to try to find two or three people at least that will be able to um, watch your dog regularly because it is such a bummer. And I say this out of my own experience. Um, It is such a bummer to take the time to build a relationship with somebody and then for that person to, you know, move on, you know, just they change jobs. And so now they work full time and when you need them, they're not available to watch your dog or whatever, something like that. So really checking that block on the front end. And of course you can't control everything. And sometimes um, people's situations may change in unforeseen ways, but as far as, um, you know, asking the questions on the front end before you invest the time in developing that relationship, um, I think that's a really good way to start at least. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, And if it's somebody in the house, it could just be a case of, well, what Mm -hmm. I mean, like we should discuss sort of what things they can do, so... So yeah, yeah. If it's somebody living in the house, maybe they could become just more involved in the dog's life. So even if you don't trust them to make up the dog's dinner, which honestly I wouldn't <laughs> trust my husband. <laughs> um, only could, well, we I feed raw, so it's not just a case of uh-huh. out a bag of kibbles. Right, right. Plus, even if it was, he'd give them too much. Um, they'd be on half <laughs> huge fungus. <laughs> I'm just laughing when you say that because every single time I go out of town for more than a couple of days, Rowan gains weight because <laughs> either my husband feeds him more or the sitter feeds him more. Cause he doesn't, I swear my dog survives off of air. I mean, he, he gets adequate exercise, but he's just must have a slow metabolism or whatever, but um, so yes, I, I totally get the, the not a hundred percent trusting other people to feed. <laughs> yeah. So you could make up the food for them and get, but get them to feed the dog. You could get them to take the dog for walks, you know, time allowing. I mean, that's always hard, isn't it? If they've been out working all day. Yes. Maybe and it, and it can be also tricky if the dog doesn't feel comfortable going with the other person. Right. And so in cases like that, um, just proceeding a little more slowly, maybe having the other person hold the leash and you guys go on a walk together or, and then start, you know, um, easing into them kind of taking over walks without you being there. But, you know, some dogs aren't okay with that. Yeah. With, with somebody else taking them for the, for a walk if they are hyper attached. So that is something we really want to be aware of and be very intentional in the way we implement our plans so that the dog is having a good experience when they're going on a walk with dad or, or whoever that other person is. Yeah. And I think that, that if that's the case, then it's important to take it slowly. Don't rush the process. Mm -hmm. Could I end up having a dog that's more? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I do think like anytime you're you're thinking about building a relationship or helping your dog build another relation, a relationship with somebody else. Just remember that relationships take time to develop. Mm. Right. Um, And also remember that, that your dog developed a connection with you. So your dog does have the capability to do that. You just need to approach it more slowly and be really deliberate about, um, how you're exposing the, your dog to this other person and how they're interacting and, and making sure that your dog is in their comfort zone during that time. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, I mean, it could be things like playing more with the dog, just spending mm-hmm. more time with it. Um, but, yeah, just it's, it's – it's, I had a couple reach out to me ages ago and the dog was hyper-attached to her um, and – 
I, you know, just said, right, let's get him more involved in the dog's life. And she messaged me back saying it was only a week or something. And they, yeah. they saw improvement straight away. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Well, and, and it's really interesting because I think that's true. It seems like when you have a dog that's struggling with separation related behaviors and they do have that hyper attachment piece, it can feel really like overwhelming almost like, you know, I can't even leave my dog with somebody else and then be okay. It's mm. very, I think it um, amplifies those feelings of being trapped and um, alone and isolated and all of those like kind of negative feelings. But one of the things that I've really noticed with my clients is that this hyper attachment piece can go a lot more quickly as far as um, coming to a solution or the dog getting better than the being home alone piece. So it is worth spending that time on the front end. Um, I call it building your village, um, finding people who can watch your dog, helping your dog establish those relationships in a safe and secure manner. Um, so that when you get on with the training part of it, you have that in place and your dog is still feeling comfortable while you're away. Um, and you're getting those breaks that you need to, to live life. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess with, with dogs, with people that don't live with, a partner or somebody else and they don't have that option um you know obviously then we we have to look at friends and family or maybe pet sitters or what mm -hmm. have you of course there's always that element of well my dog doesn't like strangers or oh that's a tough one yeah yeah, yeah. so if that if that is the case it's still doable we just have to it is yeah so we don't force the issue as in right well <laughs> Um, you know, the dog's just going to have to learn to love that person and, you know, they come and sit and you go because the dog's still going to be freaking out. But, um, yeah, mm -hmm. if they don't like strangers, then um, so so one of the things Lisa said, was she's going, which is brilliant, is she's going to get a dog person, dog sitter or what have you to come and get to know her dog. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, that whole, we, you know, knowing I, I just said to her, look, you need to make sure that you talk to the pet sitter before they even walk in the door um, on how to, because her dog's a little bit shy, I think. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so don't overwhelm the dog. Don't lean over the mm -hmm. top. Don't put your hand out. Let the dog come to you. Don't force. Right. Don't force the issue. Let the dog come to you, come to them on their own, on the dog's terms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you're not feeling overwhelmed by the strange. Yeah. I would say that if your dog is, you know, the, the shy sort or is apprehensive of strangers that I would really recommend that you reach out to a trainer to, even if it's, you know, just one consultation to give you some guidance surrounding that, mm. because, um, like you're saying this, how the person approaches, um, the dog and, the lack of pressure there and all of that can make such a big difference yeah. in the way the dog can warm up to the person. Yeah. Um, yeah so no, and, and, don't, you don't want yeah. to face the dog straight on with a kind of a full body turn to the side, don't make eye contact, all that sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no confrontational hands. <laughs> yeah. And, and no, the, um, know the dog's body language yeah. and, you know, if they're getting anxious, can you create more distance? Um, you know, can you minimize like what you're saying? You're, I tend to gesture a lot when I talk, so like, <laughs> that wouldn't be a good thing um, um, in, in that type of situation. So, you know, knowing those things, um, not creating conflict by hol holding out a treat for the dog, even, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, you know, some dogs who are really foodie can, you know, go for the treat and then realize oh, the person's right there. And then that creates um, kind of conflict for the dog. So if they're having treats, throwing them away, you know, can can be a more helpful way to do that. Um, but even if your dog doesn't have um, 
stranger danger or um, apprehension surrounding strangers, um, building a relationship can still take time. Yeah. And and so a, a question that I like to ask my clients is, what does your dog love to do? Right. Because every dog is different. Right. And if if somebody assumed that Rowan loved fetch because he looks like a lab um, and and felt <laughs> that's the way they're going to win him over, they would be sorely mistaken because uh-huh. he'll go after it three times tops. Right. So, um, you know, just know your dog. What do they like to do? And then try to facilitate this new person doing more of that with your dog and you kind of being there kind of as a a security blanket for your dog, but kind of taking a back seat to everything and letting the other person do all the fun stuff, whether that's food or tug or fetch or, you know, whatever your dog loves to do that that's for um, that would be a good way for relationship building, keeping it light and fun without pressure, um, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then it would just be a case of starting again, slowly building up, um, you know, so you're going to be there the first few times building up that, um, home alone, you know, the time that they're together while you're there and then gradually once and mm-hmm. it, it's not it's not as easy as if the person lives in the house with you because they've got more access to the dog so it's somebody coming in and whoever that person is whether it's a family member or mm-hmm. or a um you know a pet sitter or what have you but yeah they're not living in the house so that's you know the mm-hmm. dog's not going to build a relationship as quickly as they would with somebody else in the house right yeah right yeah so the other thing to note is that sometimes when dogs do struggle with that hyper attachment piece, it might be that they are more of a candidate for um, prescription medications. So that would be something um, to talk to when you're talking to your vet about whether medications are a good fit for your dog. I would talk about the separation related behaviors, but then also talk about the hyper attachment because that does add a layer um, and can make it um, more difficult to work through um, because you have that extra work to do in the beginning with um, finding ways to manage absences when you can't be there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But um, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Uh, Totally. Just I I think the most important thing is not to rush the process. Which is mm-hmm. hard, obviously, because with you know with so this issue, you want to get to the point where you can walk out the door without, without exactly yeah. But uh, rushing it's going to not pop, you know, rush slowly. Otherwise, yeah, could actually have the reverse effect. Right, right, and and with some dogs, um, them watching you leave can be really difficult. So if the person staying with them can do some distraction, whether that's going in another room and playing a game with them or taking them on a short walk while you leave, that can be a really helpful thing um, and can help um, you gain that little bit of freedom um, until your dog is ready to watch you walk out the door. So that's another kind of way to um and some dogs aren't some dogs it doesn't matter if they see you leave or not it's the same amount of distressing for them um but for some dogs that is something that can help um mitigate their reaction and i think that does come down to um you know what you're saying when you ask your clients like what does your dog love doing the best if Mm -hmm. the the person with the dog can do whatever that is um, right right uh, and then you can leave while that's happening, they're hopefully going to be less likely to be reactive when they realise you have left. Um, mm-hmm. But some dogs will still tear around the house searching for you. Exactly, um, yeah. Uh, while others will have forgotten that you exist. <laughs> hopefully that is the case if you have built that bond with that person, if that dog mm-hmm. has that bond um, with that person. Right. Right. So um, as far as strategies go, we talked about uh, building your village, sharing the love, however you want to refer to it, um, which means just building relationships with other people, making sure we take that process slowly, 
um, having that person do more of the fun stuff, whether that's actual activities, fun training games, um, food. A lot of dogs are motivated by food, so that can be a big one. Um, start with short stays and lengthen that as your um, dog is is able to. Um, and talk to your vet about meds. Mm. Sounds good. Yep. yep. And then once the dog is able to be left with other people, you get, a, you know, a, some of your life back. But also mm-hmm. then start doing some training so the dog learns right. that it can be home alone. Yeah. Yep, exactly. But at least it gives you more options um, than having than you being the only person the dog can cope with. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Cool. Alrighty. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Dog House, Separation and Somebody Explained. Uh, I'm Ms. Jones in Australia. Um, and if, I'm sure Stacey will say the same thing, um, if you need some help, reach out to us. Uh, we work remotely, yeah. so we are here for you. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Alrighty, bye. Bye. <laughs>